One of our core values as a church family here at Central Assembly is that we want to leave a God-sized footprint in our world. And today, this weekend, is our global footprint celebration, our fall mission celebration, where we focus on taking the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, to every nation, every people group around the world. And to help us celebrate this, I'm so honored that Dr. Doug Lohenberg will be our guest speaker today. Doug, would you come? Doug, uh, first of all, I have to say, Doug and I have a very unique relationship because he has four very important women in his life. <laughs> one is, of course, his wife, Corrine, and uh, then his sister. You have one sister, have one sister who you introduced me to 38 years ago, and I married her a year later. In fact, we both got married to our wives the same summer. And then you have two wonderful daughters, Julia Lohenberg, who also is a missionary like you are, like you and Corrine are, and she attends Central here and directs communications for Africa's Hope. And then your other daughter, Ruthie, who used to attend here, married Devin Lawley, who grew up at Central Assembly, and they are now on a church planning team in the Comoros Islands. So quite a family. Uh, you have some amazing ladies in your life. And Doug, we've been friends for years. Yes. Doug lives in Nairobi with Corrine, his wife, Nairobi, Kenya, and he oversees the, he's the director of the Association of Pentecostal Theological education for all of Africa. In other words, all of our AG, uh, Assemblies of God, colleges and universities, mm -hmm. and even other Pentecostal universities, he basically oversees these institutions that are training the next generation of leaders for Africa. I can't imagine a more strategic task, and I can't imagine a better person than you, Doug. You, you have a doctor in missiology, a doctor in theology, you, you're a career veteran missionary. Um, uh, thank you for being with us to come and to talk about our global footprint and what Jesus is doing in our world. So I introduce to you Dr. Doug Lowenberg to bring God's word today. Thank you, Jim. What an honor. And on behalf of our family, we wanna say a big thank you to Dr. Jim Bradford and Central Assembly because you have really ministered to us while we have lived in Kenya during closed churches. We've been watching Jim in ministry every Sunday uh, and it's been a tremendous blessing and encouragement to us. And on behalf of the entire missionary family that's part of Central, we say thank you to this great church for your prayers, your investment in us that allows us to be boots on the ground all over the world, serving you, partnering with you, reaching out to people to make disciples of all the nations. So thank you so much. I'd like for you to take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, and I want to read from verse 21 to 28. And I would entitle the thoughts today, Jesus, an Equal Opportunity Savior. I really love this passage. It oozes with the love and the mercy and the grace of our Lord for all people. So reading Matthew, chapter 15, verse 21. Leaving that place, and by the way, the place, you could drop back to chapter 14, verse 34. It says Jesus was in Gennesaret. So leaving that place, which is a little village not far from Capernaum on the northwest side of Galilee, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And that's probably 45 kilometers as the crow flies. So to get there, it may have been 50 or 60 kilometers of a walk, taking several days. Leaving that place, Jesus went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly or cruelly from demon possession. And one of those little statements that really bothers me is this. Jesus did not answer her a word. Silence. So his disciples came to him and they urged him, send her away. She keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. She prostrated herself before him. Lord, help me, she said. 
He replied, It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered, O woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Jesus, an equal opportunity Savior. I think we all understand that idea of equal opportunity. If you're shopping for a house, if you're wanting to get into a school, if you're applying for a job or a promotion, you want to be treated uh, with equal opportunity, with fairness, with consideration for the really critical factors in your life, not for some other reason. When I read this text, I think of Jesus and the equal opportunity he extends, as it says in other passages in the scriptures, whosoever will may come. When I read this passage, I don't think there's any way we can really properly understand it if we don't consider the literary and the historical context. And to do that, we've got to go back to the prior story or thought unit that leads into this particular passage. We don't have time to read through it, but I'd like for you to take time at some point and look at chapter 15, 1 through verse 20. And it said, leaving that place, well, Jesus was in Gennesaret, he had his disciples, there was a massive crowd, but it also tells us there were Pharisees that had come to him from Jerusalem and they're having an argument. Those Pharisees are saying, Jesus, your disciples don't do the proper COVID wash, you know, 20 seconds, lots of soap and water and hand washing. You're not doing the proper cleaning. They're not doing the proper cleaning before they eat. And the, the Pharisees believed, having not done proper cleaning and eating food, it contaminated them spiritually and it disqualified them from being able to approach God where he would be open and hear and listen to their prayers. So their uncleanliness externally prevented them from spiritually approaching God. And as you read, you can see that the Pharisees place such emphasis on the externals, on human traditions, but Jesus cuts through all of that and says, it's not the externals that matter, it's the condition of the heart. And it's the laws that have been revealed by God as opposed to the traditions of people. So he really pushes back on that. And in fact, he says, it's out of the heart that a person speaks. And he says in verse 18, 17, and 18, it's out of the heart that, that a person will commit immorality, theft, false testimony, slander, etc. Now, what I want you to note in this, this context the Pharisees are bringing these accusations against Jesus and his disciples of uncleanliness and separation from God and disqualification based on externals. But when they do that, and Jesus makes his comments, the disciples themselves approach Jesus and they say, Jesus, don't you know what you have said offended the Pharisees? I mean, it's almost comical that the people who are being accused of breaking the traditions are the ones defending the traditions. And Jesus turns to his own 12, the ones he called to follow him, and he says, you must leave them. You must leave the Pharisees and their teachings, their philosophies, their religion, their tradition, because he says, if you follow them, you're blind, you're following the blind, and you're all going to fall in a ditch. You just got to love Peter. Because when Jesus makes that statement, Peter says, Duh, I don't get it. I don't understand. Can you explain? And Jesus says, Peter, are you still so dull? I don't think that's a compliment. And it's in that kind of a context, externals, internals, clean, unclean, the heart speaking through the mouth, that I think we've got to have that background to come into this particular passage. 
I also think this is such a great missionary passage because Jesus very intentionally has taken the 12 and gone 45, 50, 60 kilometers into the area of Tyre and Sidon. He's in a foreign land, foreign culture, foreign religion, and he's taking the 12 on this foreign missionary exercise because it really shows us the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's coming to this region and all of a sudden, out of those villages, a Canaanite woman with a demonized daughter approaches him and cries out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is cruelly demonized. Isn't that amazing? In that village, this lady comes. You talk about an example of unclean. She's a woman. She's a Canaanite. She has been involved in idolatry. She has a daughter who is demonized. Kind of reminds me when I think about unclean of a man that's a friend of ours. His name is Hassan. He's from northeastern Kenya, the region called Mandera. And north is Ethiopia, east is Somalia, 100% Muslim. Hassan had become ill and he was dying. He'd gone to medical doctors, spiritual doctors, and he ended up in a clinic without any hope. One day he needed to relieve himself, and in that particular case he needed to go to the bush. As he was going to the bush, an attendant gave him two sheets of paper to use as toilet paper. So he went out into the bush, he squatted, but he noticed his toilet paper, his two little sheets, had writing on both sides, four pages of writing. And while he was there, he began to read in Swahili, for God so loved the world that he gave. And he read that story and he continued on in chapter 4 because it was on the backside about the Samaritan woman and on about miracles and healings. And he went back to the little clinic. He didn't use the, the TP for what it was for. He held it and he went back to his little bed in the clinic and he said, Jesus, I know you're a prophet in Islam, but this text said you're more than that. You're the savior of the world. You're the healer. You have all power. And if that's who you are, will you heal me? And in a moment, the Lord Jesus Christ healed Hassan. His disease completely left him. He left the clinic. He went back to his little house where he had a wife and a daughter. And they immediately saw the transformation in his body. And he explained it was through prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus that he had been healed. And they all called upon the Lord to save them from their sin. Well, they were so excited, they began to go out into their village and tell their neighbors about Jesus and thought they would all want to respond and believe in him more than a prophet, but Savior and Lord. A few days later, Hassan had to go on a journey. While he was away, the villagers came to his hut, took his wife and his daughter out, and they murdered them because of their faith and their proclamation of Jesus as Savior and Lord. Hassan was so terrorized, he fled to the city of Nairobi and was walking the streets, uh, fearing for his own life and just in total confusion. And he happened to come by a gate that had four letters on it, E-A-S-T, East. Africa School of Theology. And he felt drawn to go into that school. Well, he explained what had happened. He was received by our missionaries and the administrators of our school. And he was allowed to enroll where he trained to become a pastor and a minister to take the good news out to fellow Kenyans. One of the amazing parts of this story, while he was there, he went with missionaries north of Nairobi to an unreached people group called the Rendile and was part of bringing the gospel, seeing churches planted and people saved among the Rendile. Here is a man that would be considered unclean, unqualified, but what a transformation and how God used his life. I read this text and I think this woman, unclean, Canaanite, idolatry, demon possession. And don't you wish there were more footnotes in the Bible? How did she know? How had she ever heard about Jesus? What was it that she knew and saw in him that she could have the faith that if she could just get to him, he was approachable and he had the power that he could intervene and he could drive these demons out of her daughter's life. Somehow she believed and she broke all cultural, social, 
protocol. She didn't let those other issues hold her back. But she came forward, a woman to a man, a Canaanite to a Jew, especially a rabbi, somebody out of idolatry and demon possession, coming to one that she believed had the power to set her daughter free and to change all of their lives. When I think of this woman coming, and I mean, I'm a, I'm a dad, I'm a now a granddad, coming with desperation. It's just, it's shocking, isn't it? That when she cried out, Jesus said nothing. I've analyzed her cry, Lord, son of David, have mercy. And as you read through the Gospel of Matthew, other people said exactly the same thing. In fact, in Matthew chapter 8, there was a Roman centurion who said, Lord, help my servant, and the Lord healed him. In chapter 17, there's a, a man who had a demonized son, and he said, Lord, help me, help me have mercy, and the Lord healed in chapter 19, there were two blind men who said exactly the same thing. Lord, son of David, have mercy. And the Lord healed their eyes. What is it that caused Jesus to be silent? Remember the context? Remember, there are 12, although it's very interesting, in Matthew's writing, in this particular story, he didn't even mention the disciples yet. It's just Jesus and the woman, but in the silence, suddenly, 12 guys emerge, and they say, Lord, send her away. She's crying out after us. Isn't that grievous? These 12 men had been chosen by Jesus. And during that time of ministry together, they were to become more and more like him with his love, his compassion. I mean, he had empowered them. He had sent them out. They were to represent him. Lord, send her away. Why? Because she's a nuisance. She's not qualified. She's unclean. She doesn't fit into our acceptable stereotypes. She is not part of our group. Send her away away. I'm so thankful for the mercy of God, for his people, because sometimes we who are in the process of discipleship, we can be so judgmental, so quick to reject because they don't fit into our opinion of the clean and the good and the upright. And isn't it interesting to note how self-centered they were? She's crying out after us. I don't, I'm going to go back and read the text. I don't remember any reference to her calling out to them. Lord, son of David, have mercy. I wonder sometimes if we miss out on the mission of God. Even when he's sent us or made us aware of other parts in the world, like Jesus had taken these men to another country, another culture, another people, and the need was great, but they were still so focused on themselves and what they wanted. I think the silence was going back to the earlier text that says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, then right away, Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, I am a teacher. I love to give quizzes. So I'll give you a quiz. True, false. Is this statement true? Or is this statement false? You can raise your hand true, raise your hand false, but don't be a coward, you got to vote. I was sent only. Some people really believe during Jesus' life and ministry until the resurrection, he only came to minister to the Jews. I would, I would counter that and ask you to read through the Gospel of Matthew, the entirety, but begin with chapter 1, verse 1, where Matthew in this text says the, the Gospel of Jesus, the son of Abraham, the son of David, giving reference to the fact that David would have a son who would rule forever and ever. Abraham would have a son who would be a blessing to all nations. In Matthew, a little bit later in chapter 1, when he records the genealogy, he is the only gospel writer to refer to women, and there are four women in the genealogy who are all non-Jews. 
Not of the house of Israel. In chapter 2, who are the first people who come and say, we have come to worship Him? They are magi, maybe from Iraq or Iran, who came to worship Jesus. Am I sent only to the lost sheep? Jesus' earliest years were spent in Egypt. When he came back to Galilee, it says, that he, and Matthew quotes from Isaiah, that the people living in darkness, Gentiles, have seen a great light. The centurion came. The, the gospel ends with the great commission, go and make disciples of all nations. I believe when Jesus made that statement, he was going back to this reality, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. He was articulating what those 12 believed. Yes, the Messiah, he has been sent only for us, for our group, our people, our religion, our region. Not for them. They're unclean. unclean. They're disqualified. I was sent only to the lost sheep. Do we sometimes think that? It's all about us, our group, our country, our, those people that we're comfortable with. And yet I want you to see that Jesus very intentionally had gone far out of the way, foreign mission, other culture, language, people, somebody so desperately in need with demonization and idolatry and darkness in their life. But Jesus came to bring them hope and deliverance. Aren't you thankful that he did not come only for the lost house of Israel, this lady got it. Because immediately the next verse says, she came even closer. She prostrated herself in honor and worship. And once again, she calls Jesus Lord. And there's no entitlement. There's no demand. She just simply says, help me. Again, the next statement's a little bit challenging unless we see that larger context. Because then Jesus says, it's not good to take the children's bread and to toss it to their dogs. Where in the world is that coming from? You know, I think there's 12 guys who are standing there, and when Jesus makes that statement, they're probably all nodding. Mm-hmm. Yep. Don't take the bread. We're the children. This is all about us. It's all about me. Don't take it from us. Don't take the bread from us and throw it to a dog. And by the way, in that particular time and culture, dogs were not household pets. They were considered unclean, dangerous. Maybe they cleaned up the scraps and the trash, but people weren't taking their, their dogs to McDonald's. Sorry about that. They were unclean. And to take bread from children that you love, that are part of your family, and give it to a dog, it's beyond comprehension. So Jesus makes that statement, and I believe the disciples, in their own mind, that's how they viewed her. Out of the heart, the mouth. I think Jesus, once again, was articulating their view, their understanding of those people outside their comfort zone. But once again, I think the lady so understood because she responds in affirmation, yes, Lord, that's true. Don't take the bread from the children and give it to the dogs, but she says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. I love her statement. I mean, it's amazing. There's, there's no um, battling for them or us. It's, there's enough provision for both. The people seated around the table. There is an abundance, a bounty. In fact, there's so much, it's going to unintentionally, involuntarily fall off the table where those dogs are going to be able to eat crumbs. But you know what? Even a crumb from the master's table is enough. What a statement. 
This woman who has come in desperation, facing resistance and rejection from disciples with closed minds, but hearing and seeing one who is there who has come all of that distance to minister to her and her need. Yes, Lord, that is enough. Isn't that amazing? Even a crumb, even a crumb miraculously provided by Jesus is enough to save and to heal and to deliver and to transform. And Jesus looked at this woman and he said, Oh, woman. He addresses her. He respects her. He identifies her identity, her value, this, the personhood of who she is. And he says, you have great faith. Faith in who I am. Faith in what my real mission is. Faith in what I've come to do. Faith in my power and ability to meet every need and beyond. And not only for the, the, the family, but for those outside the family so that the borders really can be expanded. You have great faith. And then he said, your request has been granted and that mother who had come so concerned about her daughter at a distance, Jesus healed her. And the text says, and her daughter was healed at that very hour. I don't know where you are in distance from this location, but aren't you glad that there's no limitations to the power of the Holy Spirit? And that there's no difficulty beyond his ability to respond and intervene, whether it's salvation, whether it's deliverance from possession, whether it's the demonic, confusion, pain, suffering, loss. Jesus is able to come to your rescue and bring transformation because he truly is an equal opportunity savior. Jew, Gentile, Canaanite, American. He truly cares about all people, both genders, all, all groups, because every life matters to him. I'm reminded of a dear friend. His name is Thuo. Thuo is from the Luo tribe, way on the western side of Kenya. And this man grew up in a polygamous home. His mom was the second wife in a marriage. The first wife had a bunch of kids. Later in life, the father took his mom as a new wife, and he was the only child. Thuo grew up, and God had really gifted him with amazing intelligence, although he lived in a totally pagan, immoral family. But he went away to school, which is kind of normal in Kenya, going away to boarding school. And at the end of high school, they take these major comprehensive exams that determine if you're able to advance to, on to university and what your qualifications are going to be. So as he was preparing for those exams, he suddenly became very ill. And they couldn't find any medicine to help him. They couldn't find any reason why he was so sick. But he was so sick, he had to withdraw from school and go back to his home. When he got back to his home, his mother who was the second of, of the wives and had no other children, she said, I can't help you. And she sent him to her sister or, or Thuo's aunt, which was in another village. This lady was a born-again believer. So she took Thuo and put him in a room, and every day she'd come in, read the Bible, pray, give him a bowl of soup, pray, give him a bowl of soup day after day. And you know what? His life began to improve. The, the physical condition began to change. And one day Thuo walked out of that room to his auntie and he said, I don't know what's happened, but my life is changed. I'm healed. Can you explain? 
and his aunt told him about the Lord Jesus Christ and prayed and there were demons in his life and he was absolutely delivered. And what they found out was the first wife and the children out of jealousy had prayed curses on Tethuo. And even though he was away at a school, he had become demonized, he had become sick and he was un unable to finish those exams. Well, after encountering the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, he went back to school. He finished the exams. He did extremely well, but he said, I don't want to go to university. God's calling me into the ministry. I want to go to Bible school. And he came to our Bible school. And from that time, he's become a pastor. He's planted like 30 or 40 churches. He's a district superintendent. He's a key leader in the Kenya Assemblies of God. This Jesus that we serve is able to give out more than crumbs. He can give restoration and healing and ability that we can love people and further his kingdom. When I look at this text today, I believe it's so clearly speaking to two people groups. It's speaking to people who we would classify according to this text as Canaanites. You're outsiders. You're not part of the group. And maybe there is idolatry and, and evil powers and sin. You are distant. But don't you see how Jesus wants to walk into your world and extend a hand of love and grace to take you and meet you? And he will give you more than crumbs to bring restoration and acceptance into his family. I pray today that you will reach out to him and let that healing, saving power flow into your life, your mind, your body, your family. But there's another group. Disciples. That's us. That's me. That's you. And sometimes as Jesus is bringing us along in his love and his patience, we're not where we need to be. We're not the kind of people we need to be. It's about us. It's about our group. It's about I'm privileged. I'm at the table. I'm the child. But the mission of God calls us not only to love Him and be faithful, but to take the gospel and share it broadly around our world to every people and culture and language. Isn't it amazing, this text? because it was written by one of the 12 who stood there and looked so coldly and differently at this woman and said, send her away. But you know what? According to church history, Matthew wrote this gospel for people who lived in the vicinity of where that woman was. And as God continued to work in Matthew, there came a day that he became a missionary and took this gospel beyond. Lord Jesus, I pray for Canaanites today that they will respond and open themselves to your healing and salvation. Lord, I pray for disciples that we will become more and more of what you want us to be, to take your gospel to every person in our orbit of influence and around the world. In Jesus' name.